Well, I'm looking for a place called Malavelli. Malavelli is a village on this road which was useful for a campsite because it had got water. And what the British were planning to do is to get to Malavelli and camp for the night. Well, the British got to Malavelli and were getting ready to make camp when they discovered that across a low plain, and I've not been there, so I'm not quite sure what to expect, across a low plain there was a ridge. And on the ridge there were at least two of Tipu's heavy guns and a large part of Tipu's army. And it seemed as if Tipu was going to offer battle. This was an advantage from the British point of view because they wanted a battle because by winning a battle they could weaken Tipu's force and have a much better chance of taking Surangapata. As they marched, the British troops had been surrounded by burning fields and under occasional enemy fire. Now it was their chance to retaliate. I'm pretty sure that we're in the position of Tipu's guns. It's actually quite hard to relate contemporary accounts to the map to the ground as it now is. But this, I'm sure, is the ridge that Tipu held, looking down towards the village from which the British were advancing. The British came up that slope in two big columns. The one on this side of the village was commanded by Wellesley, and his regiments came up that slope in columns of their own. They're about halfway up when a great mass of Tipu's infantry came down from here to meet them. Wellesley swung his regiments into line, and they'd have moved like gates swinging on a hinge. Tipu's infantry headed for the 33rd, Wellesley's own regiment. And typically, Wellesley was there to give the fire order himself. There was an accurate close-range volley, followed by a charge. As Wellesley himself put it, they did not quite stand to receive the bayonet. For the first time, Wellesley had led his troops into victory. Tipu was now in retreat, with the British following behind. But Tipu's fortress of Surangapatam, some 30 miles west from Malavelli, was to prove far harder. And on the way, Wellesley was to suffer a grievous blow. On the afternoon of the 5th of April, Wellesley and his men were in camp, just over there, about a mile from the fortress. Then he received orders from General Harris to lead a night attack across the canal, which then had rather less water in it, to the woods just here, held by a party of Tipu's men. He'd only just arrived. His orders were imprecise, and he had no idea of the lie of the land. Wellesley was about to make one of the biggest mistakes of his life. As Wellesley and his men set off into the darkness, they encountered a weapon that they'd never seen before. Within minutes, Wellesley and his troops were in disarray. They didn't know where the enemy was. They didn't know what to do, and they weren't sure where they were going. Even Arthur Wellesley got lost. When he finally stumbled back to the camp, the attack had failed hopelessly, and eight of his men had been taken prisoner. The British had underestimated their enemy. At his splendid court, Tipu Sultan had brought together craftsmen of all kinds and created a vastly improved version of an old weapon, the explosive rocket. There was a corps of 5,000 rocket men in Tipu's army. Rodham Narasema is a rocket scientist at the Institute in Bangalore, and he's made a replica of one of Tipu's rockets. And he was carried by individual soldiers? It was carried by individuals. Uh, it could be carried in a kind of a sheath on the back. It could be carried in carts. And it was uh, uh, quite often launched from those carts, uh, past a ramp. And uh, they had methods by which, by changing the elevation of the ramp, the angle of the ramp, they could reach different uh, targets. Different were, they, were they very ranges. accurate in reaching these targets? No, they were not very accurate. Uh, so they were most effective and they were fired at groups of soldiers. How far would one of these have gone? 
The, the largest recorded is about two and a half kilometers. And, Goodness uh, me, that's a long way. That's, that's quite long, yes. Thousand yards was very common. They created a lot of confusion and uh, a lot of damage. And I think uh, a lot of it was uh, psychological in a way because I think uh, British troops had not encountered uh, attacks from uh, rockets before. It's certainly a, a, a reversal of, of, yes. of expectation <clears throat> to discover a European army coming out here mm -hmm. and being taken on by something that it doesn't understand and which is a real shock. Yes, yes. At midnight that night, Wellesley had reported his failure to his commanding officer, General Harris, who recorded that the young colonel had come to his tent in a good deal of agitation. The next day, Wellesley, with more men and proper artillery support, was sent to attack the outpost once again. This time, in daylight, he and his men succeeded. But the bitter humiliation of the previous night taught Wellesley two lessons that he'd never forget. The first was a military lesson of the importance of reconnaissance before attack. The second was an emotional lesson about the bitterness of defeat. All in all, he was lucky to get away with it. Had his brother not been Governor General, Wellesley might have found himself facing a court-martial. But Wellesley had little time to reflect upon these lessons. For the next few weeks, he and his troops were absorbed in playing their part in the siege of the island fortress of Seringapatam. Inside the fort were Tipu Sultan and 30,000 of his men, protected not just by the river, but by a range of defensive walls and moats. Outside, on the other bank of the river, were the British, their siege guns firing constantly over the heads of their troops, who were entrenched for protection against enemy fire. To defeat Tipu, the British had to knock a breach in the walls through which they could storm Seringapatam. For three weeks, the British cannon pounded. It was a long, hot, and noisy business. Finally, it was decided that the breach was ripe for attack. Wellesley stayed behind with the reserve, and a fiery Scots general ordered the assault. The attackers, led by a small group of volunteers called the Forlorn Hope, because their chances of survival were so slim, crossed the river just there. Wellesley was watching here on the riverbank and would have been able to see them scramble up the breach. We can see the new stonework where the breach actually was. He'd then have seen how they piled up against a set of inner defences that hadn't been breached. They bravely took a bridge and then there was vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting for a couple of hours. Finally, Wellesley could see that the fighting was pretty well over. He left his troops here and went across into the fort. Wellesley came up here to the top of the breach, passing over the bodies of hundreds of attackers and defenders. When he got here, he'd have seen that down in the town, the British army was already badly out of hand, looting and raping. This was the downside of the British soldier across the whole of the period. Phenomenal bravery in a place like this, but a tendency to get into an appalling state, especially after a moment of stress and if drink was to hand. It was something Wellesley really disapproved of, and he went down into the town to try to stop it. 